One cool thing the Infocon can do that uh, that little yellow one can't do, that's combustion sensor right on there. So we can switch this thing over and we can search 290. Don't forget, you save yourself a little bit of money. You can pick up this little weight scale here, which is pretty wicked. 3.9 ounces is what they wanted, which I just went just a touch over. That makes it pretty simple. It comes right on it through the scale and this thing's backlit, which is pretty cool. This video is brought to you in part by True Tech Tools. Quality tools, essential support. Not very often I actually get some new stuff to work on, but we're in a new location here. Dillfield, check this out. This is kind of interesting. This is our diagnostic menu. So you can actually see the temperature probe. Uh, you can see relay status. Uh, you can see everything that's going on. Let's go over here to this one. Diagnostics, temperature probes. Okay. Evaporator temperature, inlet temperature 30. Now oh, it's 30. Why is that one so much different than the other one? Interesting. Yeah, evaporator inlet temperature there. Looks like a problem for sure. It's a big shirt. That's pretty cool. Check this out. Been holding temperature pretty good, peaking up to 41. The problem they're complaining about is they're getting moisture up here in this top, and it was getting all over the down below here. And school just started. This is a brand new account to us, so we don't really know what they've been doing over the period prior to this. And it doesn't look like it's brand new, but it is R290, unfortunately. Looks like everything's still original. Nobody's manhandled it yet. The condenser's at least warm, whereas the one over there did not feel that way. They both are doing this, that's what's kind of convenient. Yeah, see that's cold, or definitely not warm, let's just put it that way. So it makes me wonder, are we freezing up the coil? What's going on? Okay, we just took off this four bolts. Guess what we find? Yeah, I think there's a problem. You got a problem there, bud. Probably low on charge or the probes are junk. So, like I said, one probe wasn't accurate. So now we got this to melt. Um, would not surprise me if it's not leaking. But it could be just that we're not absorbing heat, so maybe translating into the condenser coil too. So let's go ahead and shut this one off and uh, we'll check probes and things like that, but we definitely got some mess here. Okay, this is the other one. It is slightly froze up. Probably about normal. A lot of frost on that TXV. This one must have just went into a defrost because it just shut off. Can't just keep back on. Some defrost, see how it reacts. And they've got sensors. So that must be the inlet sensor that they're talking about it's on the actual such a meeting. Nope, it's just going through. So you've got one sensor down there. That's the true inlet. This might be the outlet coming through. on the outlet side of the TXV. I think that's what we got a strap to, can you really tell? Nice to have some paperwork on this thing. Yeah. Alright. Okay, we just put it into defrost. Let's go back out of here. Yeah, we're gonna need to find that stuff out. Yeah. Okay, we just about got it, except for all this back here. So I'm really glad they didn't turn it off because I mean, I would definitely let it keep running. It uh, definitely uh, added a couple extra minutes to the time clock here. Supposedly this is all under warranty too, so uh, yeah. You know, well, that's gonna be processed, I'm sure. 
to get a manual and stuff from Adele Field, which is pretty awesome. It's like 107 pages. And I got passwords, and you can change the defrost to time instead of accumulative, which half the problems usually are with accumulative. Um, got my uh, combustion sensor for my GTEC Stratus. Going to be checking it for leaks. Uh, can't really tell anything until we get that uh, ice melted. We should have this hopefully done here in a minute. Well, this is going good. Real good. Look at that. Yep. Got to get that bottom half here, underneath here. We just got her plugged in, blew some of this stuff out with the blower. I'm curious to know whether or not the uh, blow, the uh, evaporator fan motors work or not, because they were in ice and I just had a beverage air that had fans go bad because they got wet. So we'll have to see whether or not they kick on here. Nothing yet. Okay, we're checking out our probes. Looks like we're pretty close. And he did say we actually have six of them. All right, we just set the time and date. So there's the time, the date, and let's go into our defrost type. This is one thing I want time of day. So we want to make sure we do it when they're not busy. They said they're busy between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock. We're going to change that. So defrost can last a half an hour to 45 minutes. They said it takes about a half an hour to pull down. 10 to 1 is bad. You've got change, time change at the end of the year. So I'm going to go to 7.30, which will give us 6 hours before 1.30, 7.30, 1.30. This has an automatic defrost. I don't trust it because I know what a problem they can be. There's probably something else going on, but I'm just going to change it to be safe because I've fixed a lot of problems with it. We're going to do a leak search on this thing here in a second as soon as we know the fans run. But I was going to set this first, so let's go ahead and do that. All right, so we got 7.30, 1.30, 7.30, 1.30. Go back, have a day defrost. It seems like it's staying. Hopefully I got that in the right order. I'll check the book later. I don't have a lot of time to fool around with it. Units, we're on Fahrenheit, diagnostic, temperature probes. Things are dropping, that's good, I guess. Uh, relay status, everything's on, so it says. So let's go in here and see if these fans are running. It does appear they're running and dripping everywhere. I don't know if both fans are running, so we're gonna have to get in there closer. Yeah, it feels like it. Okay, it is running. Discharge line is pretty warm. Okay, one cool thing the Infocon can do that uh, that little yellow one can't do. That's combustion sensor right on there. So we can switch this thing over and we can search 290 or propane, natural gas, whatever you want. So all we gotta do is open her up and put it in there. So we can pull that one out. Take a protective cover off of this one. I've not used this particular one. The one I had before was a sample from when they were developing it. So we're gonna try it out. We're gonna see how well it does. So now we should be able to turn it on. And it should give us a different display here. You gotta have 1.5 uh, version there. You can see there at the top, you have a flame there. It's the left of the speaker, which means it's using a combustible sensor. So this will work with the uh, DTEC 3, just so you know. Um, the sensor can be had uh, at True Tech Tools. Discount for 8% is survival. And let's see what we can find with this thing. So this thing holds 3.2 ounces or something like that. So you're figuring, since it obviously cools, it's not completely empty. So even if it was low, it could be low as little as one ounce. And for you to find an ounce leak in an environment where it's windy like this and fully open, it's slim to none. You probably got to put something behind it to push out the, the uh, pressure, push pressure up higher, a little higher. So I'm not gonna be real surprised if I see anything. I, you know, may not have a leak. I'm just trying to be precautious here just because I've had bad luck with a lot of the R290 systems from True, which they have some True stuff here too. So kind of interesting, got a speaker back here. Uh, some of these new ovens I'm seeing here is ridiculous. They got touch screens and little make all kinds of little funny noises so I'm not getting anything big it would not surprise me if it's just a touch low or something but I'm not gonna screw with it just yet just because it holds so little and the only easy way to do it is to pull it all out and weigh it back in we're not gonna jump to that conclusion just yet we may end up just running this thing and seeing what happens 
and may have to come back. We'll just change defrost and we'll see where we're at. Cause I mean, it's fixed on a lot of things before. We know the evaporator fans are running. Uh, it was at temperature. It had a history keeping temperature, uh, even with it being all frozen up like that. So we may not have anything major going on. I just don't know yet. There's no adjustments on the off temperature for defrost termination. So that's not adjustable, they said. So there's not a lot I can do on that. But like I said, I'm getting nothing. The best way to do this sometimes is to have it completely closed up and then come at it and do it. You can use nitrogen and stuff behind it, but I'm just not getting anything. It's back on now. I did smooth it up to 36, which is where he said that they normally have it at. It's got a slow boot up speed, but we'll let that do that. We're gonna come over here and scan this one, see if we got anything since it's accumulated, potentially accumulated. Really not picking up anything. Go down low, it's propane. Theoretically, it should be on the ground. Not the only thing I can do to test this thing is probably fart on it, which I'm having a hard time squeezing that out. So that it will pick that up, it'll pick up sewer gas, at least the, the other one will. So um, I forgot I had the top of that open. So we'll get up there and scan that real quick. Okay, we didn't pick up anything on this one here. So we're gonna plug it back in too. Um, we may adjust that temperature up to 36 on this one also. Gives it a little more of an off cycle to possibly melt. No matter what, it should have never taken it to that much ice. It should have been smart enough to know it, and obviously it didn't. Uh, we're gonna change defrost on this, get this brushed off. These were uh, just installed about June of last year. And uh, put a little bit of filter material on that, which factory usually says no. But from what we found, it's better to have it on there and have less, less issues from all of the grease and stuff that's floating around in the kitchen. All right, so this one here actually had time of day defrost already, but the times, there's only two of them. And I don't trust that. I mean, maybe this one's better than some of them, but we're gonna do this one exactly the same way. That way they both go out at the same time, which I think was 7.30 and 1.30. Yeah, 7.30 and 1.30. So on this one, we're gonna go ahead and go 1.30, 7.30, 1.30, 7.30. 7.30. Kind of go in order left to right. I, I don't know if it makes a difference, but that's how we're gonna do that. Base average temperature, 35, we're gonna set it, same thing. So this one here was set for 35, I got it for 36. So we're gonna run this thing and see what we get. Now here's something you wanna know. So say you go into diagnostics and you go into relay status, compressor is on, Denser fans on, evaporators on, so it's cooling, okay? But when you go over here and look at it, it says it's in defrost, and this is to help prevent somebody from jumping the gun and saying, hey, it's uh, it's not cooling or, or whatever. But basically, that way they don't false alarm and think that you have a problem when you don't. So what it's basically doing is giving them a warning that it's in, di uh, in uh, defrost, and there you go. So we're gonna let this thing pull down. Okay, the first one we turned on is already at 39 degrees. I just went in here and took a, a picture of my temperature probes. Then I ended up uh, showing or taking a picture of the other one. So kind of comparing what we got here. Definitely not as hot as the other one, but it hit box temperature pretty quick. So I'm trying to look at my inlet and outlet temperatures to see if we're getting the, you know, a normal temperature drop and rise out of my two different coils. You can see this one here is definitely running warmer, which makes me think that it's got more refrigerant. You can also see there that 16 degree outlet uh, inlet temperature is probably uh, a little bit better too because it's possibly charged a little better. Just really sucks with this R290 crap that you can't just put a tap on it and leave on it. So, I mean, after warranty, sure you could. Then you got to take a chance of, you know, people putting the wrong stuff in it. So, so people get more familiarized with it. All right, some of you guys have given me crap for a while for not having digital stuff, but you can see <laughs> that thing is 13 inches. I mean, that uh, makes it a lot easier to go through here and actually it's the same size as a regular notepad. So you can go through and find stuff so much simpler now. Um, so we're gonna go through here and look at a couple different <clears throat> different temperature sensors. The um, units are doing pretty good. This one is off right now. So from what I'm seeing, this one's not running. But this other one over here, it's still running nicer discharge, but your probe far as outlet temperature, two degrees, that kind of sucks. 
So I just need to have some insight. I don't know if this is going to be, well, Dell Field is the same with Vantuoc, I uh, think. So uh, I don't know if they're just using those sensors for reporting only and don't do anything to the machine. Very possible. Once again, comes back to not sure if uh, it really matters. So we're going to look through this for a second and we're probably going to have to wrap it up. I got a grocery store I got to go to. Okay, here's something I see. Right here, why in the world? So the evaporator fan on the refrigerator cycles on for two minutes, off for two minutes. During defrost, the fan stays on for refrigerator. Why? Give me the option to remove that. Give me an option to remove that. Good grief, that is so stupid. And it probably is not in there. Yeah, that's great. Okay, here's your adaptive defrost. It can happen as much as every 60 minutes. And it can happen up to 20, 75 minutes. All right, guys, as you can see here, it is at 37 degrees there, and the other one's at temperature two. We just got a call from the factory saying that we're not a uh, authorized service center, which really was no surprise, but hey, they didn't know how to read their computer said that they wanted to send somebody else out. So the system's running, we changed the defrost. I don't see anything without digging deeper into it, which is why I wanted to dig in deeper. And uh, that's where we're at. So I'm gonna pull off of here and let the other and let the other people deal with it if that's what they wanna do. I think it's probably taken care of other than it possibly being low. Uh, so that's it guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Till next time, later. All right guys, we are back again. Now all of a sudden they can't find somebody to work on their stuff, so now we're authorized to do their warranty. So if you look down here, you can see the coil has frozen up that much in just a short duration of time. Now I called the guy, I think it's a little bit low on refrigerant because your condensing temperature is high because you're not filling her up. Your evaporator condensing temp suction pressure is going to get lower, so it's going to run colder. And those are my reasons along with the fact that TXV is like frozen up like crazy. I went ahead and insulated this in case there's some dripping going on. Called their tech services because it's under warranty, you got to play their stupid games. But unfortunately, we're getting stupid prizes. And unfortunately, he wants me to melt this ice out because he couldn't comprehend that. You can see there's ice down here. He couldn't comprehend what I was saying that, well, if your coil is running colder than it should be because the suction pressure is lower, because your saturation temperature is lower, it's gonna freeze up. And because these defrosts automatically terminate at 41 degrees, hmm. And there's no option to make that longer or anything like that to, comp uh, to compensate for it. Well, we're going to play stupid games here and uh, we'll go ahead and melt that out. We're going to make sure he thought that maybe one of the installers that built this thing uh, didn't get the pan in correctly. If you look down there, really ain't no way to get that down any further into that V shape there. And this one over here, it's hard to tell, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and melt the ice out and we'll... Uh, I don't know. I guess you're just going to wait around for a while. He said, well, if you want to tap into it, go ahead and tap into it. And it's like, dude, what are you going to cover, not cover? You know, what, what's your diagnostics on how to do this without tapping into it? Do you have temperatures for your evaporator inlet outlet? Uh, what your condensing temperature is over ambient and stuff like that. Do you have any of that? You don't get none of that information. This was so irritating. You go work on some big ass rack system, then you're working on this pissant little thing here. And then they act like, you know, they're, you, you, you can tell they're just reading it out of a book. It's just absolutely ridiculous. You can see this little bitty drain pan is very short. And you can see the water bubbles are going out. So there's not a restriction in the drain pan. You know, and when I was here the other day, I literally was running uh, water through this to the point where we melted, we melted it all out. And all this water was completely filled up in that pan. So I know it's clean and clear. That's what's so irritating. And that's not because of the crappy stainless to copper. It's coming right over that pan or following the stainless and coming out to the front. Don't be afraid to yank that thing up and out of there. You can disconnect two wires there. That way you can actually get into it. But you can see this pan, it's, it just doesn't drain for squat. I mean, it's slowly, very, very slowly draining down, but it's draining. Here's me, it's draining pretty good. Got a couple dribbles here to see if it follows where it needs to go. There it goes. Here I'll go over here. A little dribbles. Once it gets high enough to get the gravity to push it, it 
will go. However, if it hangs around there, it will sit there and probably freeze, especially when you're kicking out at 41 degrees and you're on an evaporator temperature of 15 or, or colder. I seen an inlet right here on the inlet at 10. I think you're getting about as good as you're gonna get it. I mean, for the most part, you can see it's draining. It's all the way down because you can lift this up. There's two, this part here is kind of a fake piece, but see how that can go up and down? It's down as far as it can go. Or far for all you proper, well, well spoken gents out there. Nothing to see here. So what's interesting is this one here was installed wrong. So that was actually faced the wrong direction. So when the um, fans were blowing down here, it was literally hitting this and blowing it right back into the return air. Totally amazing. Uh, they didn't come up with a better way to do this so that you didn't make a mistake like this. Um, yeah. So I thought maybe that one that was actually having the problems over there is having issues, but no, it's this one's wrong. And this is the one that actually looks fine. So even though, yeah, she's amazing. Which would kind of explain why these actually have eyelets here and the other side has little cuts in it. Because it's kind of hard to get up in there to those screws. This one here is the way it should be. See how these here are actually, actual have to go through it, whereas the other side was pinned. So yeah, they had it all backwards. Well, surprise, surprise, I called the factory back and I got a better person this time. He said she'd be around about 40 to 43 PSI. So we're about 10 PSI to 8 PSI low. And he agreed, yeah, it sounds like it's running a little low box right now 38 39 I can't see from here but basically what we got to do now put some nitrogen behind it find out where this leaks at okay before we get too stupid here I'm just gonna go ahead and do it with the regular which as you can see on the combustion there you can see that we have a little combustion deal there and it's obviously picking that up so we know we got on my fitting there's garbage but we're basically scanning over the coil. We're gonna throw some nitrogen behind it, see if we can find it without having to put the other stuff in it. Just a curiosity sake to see if it's uh, worth a diddly squat. Oh, there we go. That's yeah, working. I've always been very skeptical of nitrogen. I always feel like the nitrogen pushes the refrigerant around and then you have just a pocket there of nitrogen. Theoretically, it should be probably static pressure and just push out, but I don't know. When I was blowing the 290 charge, you're looking at it and it's coming out just clear. And then all of a sudden you, pull, you, know, you start seeing the wigglies inside the light when you're looking at it, a bright light like the, the ceiling. Did not pick up anything on that. Uh, just dumped in, I don't know, probably a few ounces of 404, and then put the nitrogen behind it, and we still aren't finding it. I'm, I'm pretty well done with this place. Uh, we got 250 area. That's where they told us to put it at. I've scanned all down in this area here, and I'm not picking up nothing. I've been on both sides of the coil, top, bottom, all the solder joints, down in the little well down there that always tends to leak, done the condenser, did all those. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to solder on a new tap and recharge this thing back to spec and call it a day. This has been the biggest waste of time I've seen. Okay, we're recharging it. We pulled our vacuum. Don't forget, save yourself a little bit of money. You can pick up this little weight scale here, which is pretty wicked. 3.9 ounces is what they wanted, which I just went just a touch over. It should be all right. It's 0.1 ounce. So yeah, um, wasn't watching close enough. So anyhow, it makes it pretty simple. It comes right on it through the scale and this thing's backlit, which is pretty cool. And obviously we'll zero it. So uh, let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. Now to put it back into fast mode, we can go uh, rapid pull down. This takes it out of the little time delays and stuff. So there you go, rapid pull down and it gets ready to go. They didn't mention nothing, but I know True requires you to cap it back off. So yeah, I know. 
supposed to remove that. I'm not going to remove it because I just have my lingering doubts about this thing. Um, couldn't find a leak. I have a feeling it's going to go low again and we can always sink some more time into it as the leak gets bigger if that's what it's doing. Or maybe it was never charged right. Who knows? Maybe there's a TXV failing. I don't know. At this point, I've been here way too long and it's time to go. Um, I just am not really impressed with how much time we waste on this because of the uh, back and forth with the warranty crap. I should have just ran it through non-warranty and just did what I needed to do and I could have been down the road in an hour. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, see if this thing will kick on here in a second and uh, we'll get her going. All right guys, that's going to wrap that one up. It's been a month and a half since I've been there and we haven't had to go back since and uh, the system's been working fine. Was it a refrigerant issue? I don't know, you know me. I know that going by pressures alone is not the right way to diagnose a system. And just because it was off by 10 pounds was not a really good indication that there was actually a leak. The correct way is to weigh it in. And then if things aren't correct after that, then you know there's another item causing it, whether it be a TXV or whatever. But I think it was a combination of a lot of different things causing it, whether it be not draining very well, the defrost, the cumulative defrost, you've only got one lunch cycle in the middle of the day, but yet, you know, doors get left open, things like that. Just all those things contribute to more problems. The more efficiency that they try to get out of these units, the thinner they make it, the more likely they are to leak refrigerant. They also try to, for more efficiency, they're shutting down fans, which causes them to not sense temperature as well because it's not moving air. Just all this efficiency game crap that the government likes to play just causes more problems and the person who ends up paying more is the customer. So anyhow, keep voting green. And until next time, guys, we'll catch you on the next one. Later.